toxic emotion of rejection. That's a terrible state to be in, to be rejected. It's a deep wound. When someone uh, is rejected, he'll build four walls around himself or herself. And each wall has to be broken down to set this person free. So rejection is refusal of others or the refusal of self. Feeling rejected is one of the most paralyzing emotions. It is usually unfounded in reality. However, I cannot get rid of it if bitterness, jealousy, and envy have taken root in me. Here's the paradox. The demon of rejection opens the door to demons of bitterness, jealousy, and envy. But I cannot overcome rejection without first overcoming bitterness, jealousy, and envy. Bitterness is at the root of all the demons who accuse me of rejection. Unforgiveness is the source of all bitterness. The starting point for healing rejection is therefore forgiveness. I'm going to give you uh, 13 dimensions of rejection. Rejection tells me that I'm not wanted or desired, that I have been put aside, that people push me away. Rejection reminds me of my desperate need to be loved and at the same time convinces me that I'm not loved. Thirdly, a demon of hatred tells me that no one can really love me because I'm not lovable. For as soon as someone begins to show me love, rejection immediately starts dismantling that love. And fifth, rejection prompts me to start a fight with a person who wants to love me so as to provoke rejection. Number six, rejection blocks my ability to reconcile with someone after a disagreement. Seven, rejection works hand in hand with the spirits of hatred and fear. Number eight, rejection leads me to reject the love of others. Nine, rejection tells me that I will never belong to the group, whether it's my family, my parish, an organization, my prayer group. Ten, rejection pushes me to look for an identity in the wrong places. Number 11, at church, rejection causes people to hold firmly to their position. Their identity comes from their position, not that they're a servant or a Christian. And 11, 12, rejection robs me of my identity in Christ Jesus. And finally, rejection insists that before being accepted by God, I must be accepted by man, which, of course, is also a lie. So what are, what are the sources of rejection? I'll give you uh, eight of them. In all cases where parents have rejected their child, they must repent. Then they should ask for forgiveness from their child. Then they should give their child the blessing from the father and the mother. Finally, they must expel the demons of rejection abandonment, and fear. Rejection can be born in a person even before he's born, from the very moment of the conception. If a child is not wanted by a parent, a demon of rejection can enter the child in the womb. We saw that in level one, that most of the demons that come to us are demons of trauma. In other words, you're traumatized by an event. You're overpowered by a bad event in your life. That's a, ble that's, a, that's a sore in your own being. Well, evil spirits who hate us, when they see that, they land into this trauma, manipulate it to make it worse. So the, the, the wounding itself is a trauma, but evil spirits come in and make it worse. But people need healing of the trauma more than they need uh, expelling of demons. But sometimes you also need to expel the demons. Sometimes the demons will just leave as the wound of trauma is healed. This is what happens when a child is conceived in an act of passion, especially between two unmarried people. Scripture says, 
those born of an illicit union shall not be admitted to the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation, none of their descendants shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Now this is called the curse of the law. The curse of the law can give a right to the demons of rejection, abandonment, and fear to enter the child from the womb. The child may feel shame and guilt associated with the conduct of unmarried parents. When God adopted us as his children because of Jesus, he abolished the curse of the law from our ancestors. We will see at level five the operation of curses. Some curses do come from the law. If you obey God, he blesses you. If you disobey God, he curses you. To be cursed is to be separated from God. Jesus took on himself all the curse of the law. Now, they're all listed in Deuteronomy 28. Sickness is among, all sickness is a curse, curse of the law. But Jesus took upon himself all curses, as we see in Galatians 3. He became a curse. Why? He identified with our sin. He became sin. And sin was crucified to the cross. Curse was crucified to the cross. And instead of the curse that belongs to us, since we belong to Christ, we receive the blessing that belongs to Christ. It's an exchange. So God dealt with the curse of the law through Jesus. God dealt with sin through his son Jesus by his death and resurrection. The person concerned must forgive his parents of their conduct, confess that he is a child of God by adoption in Jesus. Break the curse of the law in the name of Jesus. Then expel the spirits of rejection, abandonment, and fear. And finally, he must ask the Holy Spirit to heal his heart and give him the blessing of the eternal Father. Now, some of us might be adopted. Let's all stand. We'll say this prayer uh, to break any curse of the law. That may, might be on someone who was abandoned by his parents because born out of wedlock. Let's say it together. Heavenly Father, I decide and I choose to forgive my father and my mother for conceiving me out of wedlock. In the name of Jesus, I cancel all authority and all power that Satan has gained on me at that moment. I am a child of the Most High God. He desires me, and I am precious in his eyes. In the name of Jesus, I break the curse of the law over me, and I expel the spirits of rejection, abandonment, and fear. Restore to me what the devil has stolen, and tell me the truth about myself. Amen. When you know someone has been adopted, and they tell you so, well, you pray this prayer over them just in case, to break any curse that's on them. So secondly, the source of rejection could be in the womb. If the child is not wanted, he can be reached by a spirit of rejection. If there is a conflict and disorder in a household during pregnancy or early childhood, the child is likely to have feelings of rejection, abandonment, and fear. Families without a father. In a family, the father gives the identity and emotional stability. That's part of his role. In a fatherless family, children do not have the fullness of acceptance and parental love. Children may feel rejection. During infancy, when parents are disappointed with the sex of their child, the child may perceive rejection and experience self-rejection. The father or mother or both wanted a boy and that is a girl or vice versa. Another source is the jealousy of the father. Sometimes the father experiences great resentment at all the attention his wife gives to her child. A spirit of rejection can pass from the father to the baby, and the child grows up in a vicious cycle of rejection. In blended families, we have a similar situation. These families can instill a spirit of rejection in stepchildren of one or the other parent who is concerned about the lack of attention to the other children. There is lack of a generous love flowing between parents and children on both sides. Adopted children uh, may struggle against a deep sense of rejection 
from his biological parents. Number eight, the middle child. Often the middle child feels rejected because the oldest and the youngest receive more attention, more attention than he does. Let's speak now about the walls of rejection. I'll give you a little chart here. The very middle of it, there's rejection. The first wall is fear, fear of rejection. After that, they will build a wall of self-rejection. Then they will build a wall later on of rejection of others. And finally, they'll even build a wall of desire of rejection. Let's look at these four walls. There are four interrelated sources of rejection. Fear of rejection, self-rejection, rejection of others, and the, the desire for rejection. Together, these four roots form walls that imprison the supplicant in rejection. He must repent of each of these walls and command them to leave before ordering the principality to leave. You just have to ask the person, do you, have, do you fear rejection? That's one wall. Um, do you reject yourself? They know it. There's a list of things you could show them. The third wall, do you reject others before they reject you? It's a defense mechanism. It doesn't hurt as much if uh, you've rejected them and then they reject you. Well, it's not a big deal anymore. But it's terrible. You're isolated. And finally, even desire. So you ask them, do you have a desire? And then once you've identified the walls that are in this person, then you, in the prayer ministry, you'll come against each one and break them down. To break these walls and these roots of rejection, it is necessary for him to repent of them one by one for allowing them to come into his life and to repent on behalf of his ancestors. So ask God to seal. Now, I have, when I say the prayer, I have people put their hands on, your, on their ears. They say, your ears to no longer hear rejection, on their eyes to no longer see rejection, on your reason, the hand on the head, to no longer perceive rejection, and on your mouth to no longer speak rejection. It's symbolic. But for some people, symbolism is very powerful. So let's look at these four walls. The first wall, the fear of rejection. Rejection by itself is already quite painful. However, when it is associated with the fear of rejection, it becomes even more powerful. Fear produces more rejection. Fear of rejection immobilizes us, preventing us from taking risks. It imprisons us behind a wall. We feel rejected even if, we all, if all we did was to think we were rejected. There are three powerful demons of fear at work in rejection. The fear of man, the fear of failure, and the fear of rejection. We must expel all three. When we are under spiritual attack, we often gravitate towards rejection and bitterness. However, it would be best to run to God. Scripture says, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The defense mechanisms in reaction to rejection. So like a turtle, I retreat into myself. I will not allow others to reject me. I will never go near others. Fear dominates my behavior, particularly the fear of man. So this fear has to be broken. Fear of failure. Drives me not to take any chances in a relationship. By avoiding the risk of rejection, the fear of rejection, I protect myself. But I miss out on the richest things in life, interactions and relationships with others. Anger and hatred protect me from rejection from others. My aggressiveness fights bitterness against real or imagined enemies. Rejection joins bitterness. Both strengthen and nourish each other. I'd like to say a few words about uh, false intimacy. False intim intimacy is common in people who have uh, been wounded by the trauma of rejection. When a child experiences rejection at the mother's womb or at a young age, he becomes fearful 
and enters a mode of self-protection. Thus, he removes the spiritual protection of his parents. It's a form of rebellion. He does not feel close to his parents. The child cannot have a real, close relationship with his father and mother, which feeds his self-pity, his low self-esteem, his shame and lust. So he establishes a false intimacy. The empty hole in his heart creates a great need he will try to fill with sex, drugs, possessions, power, rank, adulation. In adolescence, the boy offers girls a relationship in exchange for sex with as many girls as possible. The girl offers her body in exchange for security and love. Finding no real satisfaction in these things, he thirsts for something more exciting, and curiosity drives him to try dangerous and obsessive things. His sexual addiction pushes him to homosexuality, her to lesbianism, and to bestiality. His other yearnings drive him to harder drugs, to more possessions, to power. So I've given you here a, a, a prayer against false intimacy created by rejection. Let's stand and let's say this prayer together. Eternal Father, I repent and renounce the sin of false intimacy in my life. I repent of all the ways that I have looked elsewhere for love that I can find in you. I choose intimacy with you. In the name of Jesus, I command all the tormentors and principalities of bitterness, self-hatred, jealousy and envy, rejection, fear and the occult that were assigned to me because of my sins, sins of my ancestors, or because of a generational curse of false intimacy to depart from immediately. Heavenly Father, I pray you to place the cross of Jesus between me and the spirits of rejection and fear. I ask your forgiveness for entering a mode of self-protection, withdrawing myself from the spiritual authority of my parents. I recognize that this was a rebellion. I have not had a general relationship with them. I have not honored them as I should have. I ask your forgiveness for my self-pity, for my low self-esteem, for my shame, rejection, fear, and lust. I regret the emptiness of my heart and its yearnings, the charm of sin that drew me to curiosity, excitement, obsession, and dependency, especially sexual, and I beg your pardon. May all this come to an end on the cross of Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, heal my heart, my soul, and my body. O oh, Holy Spirit, reveal to me the truth about this situation. Amen. We'll come back to this in level four when we talk about uh, sexual healing of uh, pornography, uh, um, masturbation. Um, a lot of it is due to um, this false intimacy, which, which should be broken, to be freed. So the second uh, wall is uh, self-rejection. Self-rejection tells you that even you know you're not worth that much. In your childhood, someone important to you told you. You'll never succeed. You're not worth very much. It's always your fault. You must be perfect. You're defective. You'll never learn. You'll never change. Now, the worst part of it is that it's not that it was said, but that you believed it. And it became a lie that rules your life. You heard this lie and you believed it. The lie became self-rejection. Self-rejection is often an intense and irrational need to succeed. You need to prove to your parents, to the world, and to yourself that you are useful and valuable. However, the feeling of rejection can never be quenched. And if the goal is to be accepted, you push yourself increasingly into the hole of rejection. 
you will never be good enough to overcome the sense of rejection. If you grew up in a family without acceptance and without unconditional love, and if you were treated as someone with very little value, you will probably live with rejection and self-rejection as an adult. Self-rejection works hand in hand with self-hatred and the demons of a lack of love. The rejected individual seeks an identity and the comfort of other people and not of God. Rather than emulate Jesus, I idolize another person. I am compelled to find someone to follow and worship rather than to focus on the Lord and to worship Him. Eventually, this human being will also reject me or I will perceive that I am rejected by him and I fall lower. The rejected person looks for someone weaker than him to be with him. Weaker persons don't threaten him as much as stronger people. Because I do not know who I am, rejection prompts me to invent a personality to which I attach myself until I am discovered, and once again, I am rejected. The third wall is rejection of others. It's a defense mechanism. I usually reject others before they reject me. Therefore, I protect myself from the pain of rejection. I'm afraid to be vulnerable and transparent with others because I cannot trust them. The last wall, which is the worst, is rejection-seeking, to, to desire to be rejected. This is the most vicious form of rejection. This is the result of a demon of self-hatred. Thus, I manipulate others by treating them poorly or with indifference until they reject me. This is what I wanted. In this way, I confirm to myself that I am nothing that I am worthless, that I have no identity. And a final note on madness, because rejection leads to madness in some cases. Fear, rejection, and rebellion are the volatile ingredients of madness. The best antidote against madness is to accept who I am in Jesus Christ, the one who is my strong defender. Scripture says, because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Papa, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir, through God. A healthy self-image looks beyond the now to look towards the future in Christ, where we are made perfect. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Jesus leads us to perfection. The spirits of the righteous made perfect. He who is the beginning and the conclusion of faith. Some people believe that their holiness depends on them. It really depends on the Holy Spirit. That's his job. It's his task to give us life, eternal life, God's life, holiness. A few words on rejection and idolatry. I need to know who I am in God's eye, not in the eyes of men. As soon as my identity in God is safe, I can do, my, I can do ministry to others, even in their sin, rather than let myself be hurt or offended by their remarks. Other people, what other people say just doesn't affect me. They have no power over me with their words because I belong to God. I'm securely a child of God. And they cannot destroy that because God is my protector. What other people think of me is not as important as what God thinks of me. That's my security. So receiving and accepting rejection is a form of idolatry. Grab hold of that. If you allow the words of others or the deeds of others of rejection, 
to affect you, you're giving to them a higher status than God's. You're giving their words and their deeds an infinite power while you reduce God's opinion of you and God, what God says of you to being of less value than what they say or do. That's idolatry. Only God is God. No creature is God. You cannot give eternal value to the sayings of any created being above the words of the Creator. What He says is eternal, and only what He says has eternal worth and value. I cannot prevent someone from rejecting me. Other people have problems with you. But it's not because they have a problem with you that you need to have a problem with them. They don't go together. They're not linked unless you link them. But I can control how I will react to rejection. If I react to his, eject, to his rejection by receiving the pain of rejection, I give more importance to his words or his actions than to those of God. This is a form of idolatry. It's like a solar eclipse where the sun disappears due to the interposition of the moon in the sky between it and me on earth. The moon obscures or blocks the sunlight in this way. I allowed the words or action of a human being to obscure or to block the words and deeds of God. This is sin. I'm not obliged to receive the pain of rejection of another person. If I do, I've chosen to receive it. It's a choice. It's part of your will. You didn't have to, but you did. And you'll suffer for it. And you're also sinning against God because you're distrusting God's words. Listen to this. This is the inheritance God has promised us. To us, the children of God. Listen to it. Your children shall be taught by the Lord. Even if our children are far away. This is what God says to you. Do you trust God or don't you? Well, this is what he says about your children. Your children shall be taught by the Lord. And great shall be the prosperity of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. For you shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. If anyone stirs up strife, it is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife with you shall fall because of you. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper. And you shall confute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, says the Lord. Now, this is his declaration for us. So who cares what people say about you? Who cares? The Lord's on your side. If the Lord's on your side, who can be against you? They can't prosper against you. Because the one who prospers, who prospers everything is for you. He's with you. He's in you. So be safe and secure in what the Lord has done and the Lord promises to do. Now we live in time, and these things occur in time. But beyond time, there's eternity. Beyond time, there's eternity. That's a long time. That's millions and millions of millions of centuries and millenniums. They say this sun that's shining today, I'm glad it's shining, has now been burning for five billion years. It's going to burn for another five billion years, we're told. Well, one day I'm going to see this sun burn out. I'm going to watch it. Poof. Whoop. I'll be there. You'll be there too. I'm going to see it. I have a beginning. So do you. I have no end because I'm in God. Forever I'll be with him. How do you gain release from rejection? Cultivate your intimacy with God the Father, with Jesus, the Word of God, and with the Holy Spirit. It's in our relationship with the Trinity that we're healed of rejection. 
God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. The antidote to fear is the power of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit gives us power. The Father gives us love. Jesus is the truth, the Word of God. He gives us a healthy mind. Intimacy with the Trinity repels fear from us. Start your day with a time of intimacy with the Lord and walk with Him all day long. First of all, accept God's love once and for all. Settle it for yourself. Don't keep going back and putting it into doubt. Settle it once for all. God loves you. God loves me. Let's say, God loves me. God loves me. Settle it. Be, be at peace with that. He's in love with you. He's forever next to you. He's never turned his eyes away from you since the moment of your conception. He never falls asleep. He's always looking at you with love, with tender love. At this very moment, he's looking at you with tender love. Anytime you mention his name, he rushes his ear to your lips to hear you say his name. He loves it when you say his name because he loves you. He's ever with you. He never leaves you. Never. He's always there. Do not hesitate. Ask with confidence. Get rid of a duplicitous soul. Two minds. Stop being unstable. But he should ask in faith, says St. James. Not doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed about by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, since he is a man of two minds, unstable in all his ways. Make up your mind that you belong to God. Hold on to that. Never doubt it. If you have a doubt about it, doubt your doubt. Don't doubt your faith. Why should you doubt your faith? Everybody has doubts. Get rid of the doubts. Don't doubt your doubt. Doubt your doubt. Don't doubt your faith. Get rid of the doubt. Just ignore it. It's like a bird flying over your head. I've said that. There's no problem with birds flying over your head. But don't let a, hair, don't let a, a bird make his nest in your hair. That's a problem. Don't let a thought occupy your mind. Let your thoughts go by. Who cares? We all think of all a million things today. They just keep going by. Some come from us. Some come from the devil. And some come from God. If they come from God, hold on to them. The devil always reject them. And you always well make up your mind. But never doubt of God's love for you, his care or his power. God wants to, wants to free you. If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed, says Jesus. <laughs> Why do you doubt it? If God is for us, who can be against us? If the Creator is on your side, who cares who is against you? In what way does it matter in the long term? Do you not know that God governs your life? Submit your life to Him. We know that by turning everything to their good, God cooperates with all those who love him, with all those that he has called according to his purpose. Believe that God has predestined you to be conformed to the image of his Son, that God has also called you, that he has also justified you, that he has also glorified. Not all the past tense in these words. It's all been done. Just like healing. We were healed in his wound. 2,000 years ago, God merited through Jesus your healing. It's already bought and paid for. A dear price, in fact. An excessive price, but it's, it's been bought for. In his wounds, we have been healed. It's done. We live in time for it to accomplish itself because we live in a in a time dimension, 
Time is simply measurement of movement. One day is the time it takes for the earth to turn around itself once. A year is the time it takes for the earth to go around the sun. Time is a measure of movement. God doesn't live in time, and evil spirits, uh, angels don't live in time. They don't have movement that we do. They diff- live in a different dimension than we do. Because this is how it is. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Neither death nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. Why would you let rejection rule in your heart? This is who you are, according to God. Now, who's more trustworthy? What somebody said to you or what God says about you? Who should you believe? I'd believe God if I were you. God says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. And he's going to do it. Give him time. He's going to succeed with all of us. Nothing's impossible to God. You're not the exception to the rule. That's baloney. He can change you too. He's going to make a saint out of you and of me. Just like him. Because God is holy. His children are holy. He destined you for adoption as his child through Jesus Christ. After you believed, you became the first installment of our inheritance towards redemption as God's possession. You received the power to become children of God, who were born of God. You are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. All that belongs to God the Father belongs to you, because you're an heir of God. All that belongs to Jesus, the eternal Son of God, also belongs to you, because you're co-heir with Christ. That's your inheritance. You're a child of God. A child receives from his father an inheritance. All that belongs to the father belongs to you. All that belongs to the son belongs to your infinitely rich in goodness and in purity and in holiness and in righteousness and in power and majesty for eternity. You have closed yourself with Christ not as a mere garment, but as a reality that penetrates deep within you, your being to deify you, to make you God, in God, with God, for God. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything else has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what you do as as prayer leaders. It's a ministry of reconciliation. You're bringing people back to God. It's always a ministry of evangelization. Healing is always a ministry of evangelization. People have to see things differently than before. Metanoia, it's changing directions because you believe the good news. You are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. That's our destiny, to do God's works. So second thing, the first thing, believe God. Secondly, renounce all rejection. Return to the teachings of bitterness and self-hatred. Make sure that you have resolved any unforgiveness. God is with you. Who can be against you? Because God accepts you, you must accept yourself. Then overcome the rejection of others. Remember that receiving and accepting the pain of rejection of others is a form of idolatry. You have no control over preventing the rejection of others. People will reject you. They will. (laughs) Just like they rejected Jesus. And the closer you get 
to God, the more people will reject you. Expect it. It's part of the territory. If they rejected the head, they'll reject the body. If they rejected Jesus, they're going to reject you. The world is run by Satan, and he hates Jesus. Anybody that belongs to him, he's going to reject and have people belonging. Satan will have people belonging to him reject you, to hurt you. So you'll get discouraged, commit suicide. He wants you in hell with him. He'll do what he can to destroy you. He hates you. But God is for you. He's more powerful. You can't control what people will say or do, but you can control your reaction to rejection. If you react to his rejection by receiving the pain of rejection from the other person, you commit a form of sin. Understand this and you'll be free. You are never obliged to receive rejection. If you do, it is a sin of idolatry. And as you place the words and deeds of a human being above the words and deeds of God, anyone who feels rejected will reject you. If he is bitter, he will express bitterness towards you. If he is jealous or envious, he will express it to you. However, you're not obliged to receive his words and actions in your heart. You have a choice to make. To be rejected is to be accepted to be rejected. If you understand this, if you prepare your heart, if you remain safe in God and your position in Him, you become victorious over rejection. Remember that even if someone rejects you, God will not reject you. False love depends on the approval of the other. If you receive someone's approval, it will allow you to have a relationship with him. Nonetheless, he may withdraw his approval of you at any time. True love is unconditional. Such love is built on an already established relationship and not on the approval of another person. Here is its foundation. Your miraculous relationship with God through his son Jesus. Such love makes you strong even when you fail. You can fail in a particular project or endeavor. God still loves you. His love of you does not depend on your successes or failures. There's nothing you can do to increase God's love for you. Nothing. There's nothing you can do that can decrease His love for you. There's nothing. He loves you infinitely. You can't do anything to decrease his love. He just loves you, period. As dirty and as soiled as you are, he loves you exactly as you are. He takes you in his arms uh, like the father and the prodigal son. He just came back from taking care of the pigs. Imagine the stench. Just opened his arms, just received them, grabbed them, kissed them. That's how the father receives us all the time. Now repent for your sins of rejection. Stop believing the devil in his lies. Repeat and believe the truth of what God thinks of you. You are precious to God. He accepts you. Rejoice in him and in his creation today and forever. You are the apple of his eye. The Lord's own portion was his people. Jacob, his allotted share. He shielded him, cared for him, guarded him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle spreads its wings, takes them up, and bears them aloft on its pinions, the Lord alone guided him. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior, of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Guard me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. He will never forget you. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget. Yet, I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hand. Were the righteousness of God for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. We are what Jesus is because we believe in him. Not because of our works, but because of his works. 
we're saved because of Jesus. Because we belong to him, all, that, all that's his is ours. Because of our trust in him. The crown of righteousness, from now on, there is, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. 